Is Neil? Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted, even as many were amazed at him. So marred was his look beyond human semblance, and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, Kings shall stand speechless, for those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, 
he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny when he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sins of his people? A grave was assigned him among the wicked in a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see the descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty. Because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, into your hands I come and my spirit. Father, into your hands I come and my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands I command my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. For all my foes, I am an object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, 
since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Praise and honor to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. Praise and honor to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. Christ became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Praise and The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas his betrayer was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, 
went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he had said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. 
When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit.
now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In my five years of nursing as an ICU nurse in St. Louis, I figured I took care of probably about a thousand people over the course of those five years, 1,000 patients or so. So it's impossible to remember many of them. It's been over 10 years ago now as well. But I remember a few. And in particular, around this time of the year, early spring, late winter, I remember this young man, I'll call him Stephen. He was only 21 years old, very healthy, normal young man. He'd been sick though for a few weeks, just he couldn't seem to get over a cold or a flu possibly. But he was getting a little bit better and he went with his friends one night to a St. Louis Blues hockey game, enjoyed himself, but as they were leaving the game, he couldn't walk because his chest was just starting to pound so fast and so forceful and he couldn't catch his breath. So he sat down and his buddies, some of them, they went and got the car. They came and they picked him up and they were able to get him home. But after being home for just a little bit, his parents realized he needed to go to the hospital. He needed to go to the ER. And when they got him there, they hooked him up to monitors, machines, and they realized that, yeah, his heart was beating way too fast. And it wasn't beating in a normal rhythm like yours is and mine is probably right now. And that he wouldn't survive much longer if they didn't act immediately. And so they did what they were trained to do. They put, put him to sleep real quick. They hooked a machine up to his chest and they shocked his heart to try to get to beat normal again. Unfortunately though, sometimes when you do that, there's a very small risk that the exact opposite, the worst case scenario could happen. And it happened to Stephen that evening where his heart completely stopped. And the doctors and the nurses there are able to get a heartbeat again, and then they're able to send him to the hospital that I was working at to our cardiac ICU because they couldn't care for him there because of the severity as he was. And the, the best case, the hopeful scenario is that he would get well enough to where we could give him a heart transplant. But for two weeks, I took care of this young man and just kind of watched him deteriorate physically in his bed. And after two weeks, he passed away. But this year, as I was remembering him, because he comes up often again this time of the year for me, I wasn't so much remembering this young man, Stephen. I was remembering his mother, who was a widow herself. 
And the first day that I walked in to take care of him on the night shift, what I noticed that his mother had placed a rosary over his bed. And that automatically told me that this is a woman of faith, a woman who has the Catholic faith. And for those two weeks, she was present to her son day and night. She would go home at times, but she was present to her son. And in being present to her son, it wasn't about her, but it was all about him. Even when family members and friends of Stephen would come visit, it was always about him, sharing stories about him. And when they would ask her, what can we do for you? She would deflect all the intention, not out of pride or a lack of awareness that she too wasn't suffering, but it was all about her son for those two weeks. Pray for him. And just in keeping the focus on her son, she never lost hope. She never gave in to discouragement. She never cursed God, asked God, or screamed out, why my son, that my only son? But she maintained hope, initially, yes, that he would survive. But then she ultimately maintained hope when the doctors and myself had to tell her that it was time to let him go. And she did. She let him go because her faith in those two weeks told her that, yeah, my heart aches right now. And she did indeed have many tears and a great sorrow, but she knew that there was a hope that her son wasn't just dying, but that Christ was going to meet him and bring him to life eternal. And as I've been reflecting on him, especially a lot this week, in preparation for today and pre- preparing and thinking of his mother, the Lord has just kind of revealed us that that was my mother at the foot of the cross. Stephen's mother exemplified what my mother did for me at the foot of the cross and what Mary wants to do for each of us in our relationship with her son. Notice in John's gospel, the passion narrative that we just read, Jesus realized that everything was finished in his life on this earth. Once he looked down to the disciple John and said, woman, behold your son, and John, behold your mother. One of his final acts on earth, his mission wasn't complete until he gave Mary to each of us. And Mary wants to be a part of our lives, especially on this Good Friday to prepare for the resurrection. Because what Mary shows us as the mother of God, the mother of Christ and our mother as well, and why Jesus gave her to us from the cross, is she knows how to be present to her son and she teaches us how to be present as well. As we gather this evening for this passion, this commemoration in which we remember the death of Christ, we don't come as if it is a play or a musical but we come as if it really and does happen today. You participate in the Passion narrative. You will come in soon to venerate the cross. It's not something passive that you leave behind, but you come to be present to our Lord in this moment to then be attentive to him and to look upon him. That's the second thing that Mary teaches us is that it's not about her. It is about her son. One of my favorite paintings of the Passion is by a Dutch artist that with Mary at the foot of the cross, she's not looking down. She's not reflecting on herself, but she's she's looking up at her son to be there with him, to console him, to let him know that he is not alone. We unite our sufferings, our own crosses to the Lord in this moment, to his suffering, to his cross, yes, where he defeats death and sin once and for all, and gives the power of the sacraments through his pure side. But today is about him and not us, and that is what Mary teaches us. And by being present to him and looking up towards him, just as Mary did, what she teaches us is to be patient and to always have hope. To be patient and to always have hope. Our founder, Father Lanteri, 
one of his many sayings, very simple sayings, is never give in to discouragement. Discouragement is the greatest enemy in the spiritual life. Why? Because we focus on ourselves and we forget to look up at Jesus. Did Mary's heart ache on the passion? Yes. Did she have great sorrow and probably shed many tears? Yes. But she maintained hope. And we enter this very brief but somewhat awkward moment in the life of the church for these next few days where when we come in, Christ isn't present in the blessed sacrament. And the church can just feel different, but there's nothing that we can do to hurry up the process. There's nothing that we can do to make Jesus resurrect any sooner, which very much goes against our very lives and our culture where everything comes to us at the click of a button or the swipe of a finger. When the person on Boylston Street doesn't move fast enough at the green light, we honk their horn as if that's gonna make them step on the accelerator sooner. yet Christ gives us his mother, especially at this time, to maintain hope, to trust in his words that he will rise again, to continue to be present to him, to continue to face and have our eyes focus on him and not so much ourselves. That as we look up that we don't just see him being placed in a tomb, that we can welcome him with our eyes, with our actions, just like Mary, at the glory of the resurrection. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Sean, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel.
Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand.
Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
at the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unseasonably devoted to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son and the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.